Greetings and various assorted salutations. Welcome to a world history lecture for uh, world history on starting the Cold War. Our objectives for this little to, for this little lecture is to summarize the outcome of World War II and how that contributed to the development of the Cold War. Um, additionally, we'll look at um, the con the continuing Cold War conflict in Germany and Eastern Europe. We'll look at the growth of the nuclear arms race, and we'll analyze how the Cold War becomes a global conflict. And um, we'll also look at the two major players, the United States and the Soviet Union, in this conflict. But to kind of start things off, the way the Cold War falls out is with the end of World War II, fascism, the main enemy of most of the world, um, was defeated and now it was a sorting process between the two major si political systems that were in the US and the USSR um, which came to be referred to as the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc depending on how you look at it but anyways Essentially what happens with the end of World War II, the Soviets, the United States, and the British never actually really liked each other. Um, the British and the Americans just agreed to work with the Soviets because they all disliked the Nazis. Um, that's what that kind of amounted to. And with the end of World War II, the only major nations referred to as superpowers, given their ability to influence the economics, politics, and their militaries could go just about anywhere in the world. Um, superpowers, that's what we call them, were the United States and the USSR. Um, America is going to abandon its traditional policy of isolationism, and under President Truman, the United States is going to begin attempting to counteract the communist global threat, um, according to the United States. But. Here's a picture at the Potsdam conference. Things are falling apart, though, at that point. So, first, let's talk about Soviet aggression. Um, Stalin really showed his aggressive intentions with the end of World War II um, by espousing the communist ideals of global revolution. Um, Stalin backed communist rebels in Greece and Turkey, um, and there were various rebel groups that had some vague tie to the USSR or the ideals of communism in various parts of the world trying to set up um, a new world order under communism. Um, this is perhaps best outlined in the Iron Curtain speech, which is a short little, sp which was a graduation speech that Winston Churchill gave at Westminster College in Missouri. And he basically said that the world, particularly Eastern Europe, is divided between the Soviets and the West, um, depending on how you look at it. But this Iron Curtain was the mentality. The red line is the Iron Curtain. On this side you have communism, and on this side you have capitalism. Um, Germany was split in two. Uh, actually, it was originally split into four pieces, but as time went along, the three, the three pieces under the French, the Americans, and the British condensed into West Germany, and the Soviet-controlled half became East Germany, with Berlin, of course, being divided, um, much like the nation of Germany itself. But there's another map. So... As the Cold War deepens, the superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union are going to face off against each other in Europe and around the world. Um, there's no direct confrontation. U.S. troops are not openly firing on Soviet troops. Soviet troops are not openly firing on U.S. troops. But what happens is, is America and the Soviet Union will invest in resources to um, basically fight each other indirectly. So like as I told you above before, the revolutionaries in Turkey, they got a lot of their supplies from the Soviet Union. The count, the people putting down the revolution um, were often supported by the British and the Americans in return. Um, one of the examples of this divide is the Berlin Wall, for example. Um, there's all kinds of different conflicts going on. This is just a broad overall summary of um, this whole unit. But... 
two alliances will form. NATO will form in the in the West, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and then the Warsaw Pact will form over here with the so nations of the Soviet Union. Basically, these two alliance groups pr um, promise mutual defense. You attack one of us, you attack all of us mentality. Um, if the Soviets were to pour over the borders and attack West Germany or Italy, the NATO forces, all these countries, and the United States and Canada would intervene and protect West Germany. Likewise, if um, Norway invaded into the Soviet Union or West Germany invaded into East Germany, the Warsaw Pact would rally together and defend the nations of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, this alliance system it basically split the world and then there's a big push for on both sides to try and flip other countries to their side because not everyone was aligned with the US or the Soviets but quite a few of them were um, this conflict appears in all kinds of things so while there wasn't a hot war a war of actual fighting between these two superpowers there were a lot of smaller conflicts there was the issue of the Berlin Wall where East Germany built a wall around itself to prevent people from fleeing into the West now if you ask the East German government they would say it's to prevent the evils of capitalism seeping in from the West and corrupting the good honest Eastern proletariat. Um, so there's also war propaganda going on as well. Um, there's the space race. Uh, the reason why we have satellites in the outer space is partially out of it's a leftover product of trying to outwit the Soviets and the Soviets trying to outwit the United States. Uh, we also have an arms race with nuclear weapons first used and hopefully only used in Japan at the end of World War II, nuclear weapons become an incredibly important feature of the Cold War as with the ability to destroy almost anything instantly um, that creates a strong deterrent for the Soviets and the US to not directly fight each other. Um, but this chart here gives you an excellent summary of some of the weapons. You've got some different new types of nuclear weapons. Um, you've got uh, um, ways of launch, different ways of launching nuclear weapons. Uh, everything from underwater, um, railroad cars, even some cannons, artillery pieces were designed to fire nuclear weapons. Um, these kind of things. And the Soviets and the US built up massive stockpiles of nuclear weapons. Um, under the assumption that if both sides had a lot of nukes, they would be ready to use them if the other side did. Um, there are some control treaties put into place that we'll look at separately, some of them as we progress through this unit. But Now let's look at the Cold well, We've looked at the Cold War as kind of a European, American, Russian conflict, but it's also a global conflict. Um, the Soviets were committed to supporting communist forces wherever they could be found, be it China, Korea, Cuba, um, etc. Um, likewise, the United States um, believed that they could contain communism and prevent a domino effect. Uh, the domino effect is basically the idea is if one country falls to communism, that will cause more countries to fall to communism and the domino theory was used to inspire Americans to fight in places like Korea, in Vietnam, um, under the fear of if we don't stop communism here it will one day be knocking on our own doors or, the ch or our children's doors. Um, so what this amounts to is that both the Soviets and the US are scrambling to build alliances and military bases around the world so that there are more places that each side can deploy their troops from. Um, but So like this gives you an idea of where the forces are being, the disputes are. You'll notice that the green areas are non-communist countries and there's still some conflict in these areas because the goal is to flip them either to the US side or the Soviet side and so there's a lot of fighting in with that. Afghanistan is a particularly infamous example. 
um, as well as Vietnam, um, where this conflict gets really ugly. Um, there's the issues of Latin America. There's a lot of revolutionaries who get backing from communists. Uh, the U.S. is also trying to prop up various governments in this area as well. Uh, well it's a topic for U.S. history, but there's the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, a lot of people overlook this story, but the U.S. was moving nuclear weapons into Turkey. Um, and so as a direct response, um, look at how close Turkey is to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union figured it would be perfectly reasonable to put missiles into Cuba. Uh, and this crisis was diffused, fortunately, but it was basically agreed that, no, we won't keep nukes in Turkey, and they won't keep nukes, nukes in Cuba. Um, that was the negotiation of that affair. But now let's look at the Soviet. Let's look at the particular factions. We're going to look at the Soviet Union first. Um, essentially, the Soviet Union was formed um, during, well, mostly after World War One, between World War One and World War Two, and it was a very difficult time for the for um, the Russian people and the Soviets. Uh, trying to organize things and pull themselves out of an economic slump and f multiple famines. Um, Stalin probably wasn't the greatest help with that. Stalin became the leader of the USSR um, after, after Lenin. And Stalin's main issue was purging his enemies. Um, he filled up labor camps with enemies of state. Um, he launched multiple purges. Um, he had his political opponents assassinated, denounced, um, or many of them disappeared. Uh, and it was just kind of a brutal state in the Soviet Union. But the United States um, has this conflict as well. Um, the United States, you have to remember that communism, the USSR and the Soviet Union, and the United States of America represent two different world views. Um, let's pull up this chart to kind of get a good look at it. Essentially, the USSR, representing communist countries, um, they believed in a particular political system where the Communist Party makes all political decisions, the government controls all its aspects of the economy, and the political leadership, since they're acting in the best interests of the people, the people need to obey that authority, and they need to make sure that they are following the orders of the central government, because the government has their interests um, watched out for. The democratic capitalist countries operate on a different worldview. Um, the democratic countries believe that they should have elected officials chosen by the people for the people to make decisions. Um, so whereas in a communist country they would ban all their political parties because they're unnecessary, in a democratic country they would encourage most political parties to exist. The reason why I say most is there are some exceptions. Um, parties like the Nazi party um, were obviously crushed, so fascist groups were crushed in this res uh, in the in matters, and especially in the West, um, communist parties, while they could and did exist in many places, including the United States, they were never very popular, and they were frequently harassed by the system because they were seen as a front for communism to infiltrate these countries. Um, with democratic countries, instead of a command economy where the government decides things, it's a market economy where essentially supply and demand dictate um, the prices of things, the availability of things, um, matters like that. Um, essentially private individuals, private corporations uh, make a majority of the decisions. Um, the political leadership of these places values uh, freedom, but particularly prosperity. Um, essentially, the idea behind the democratic capitalist countries is their argument is capitalism has provided the greatest good for the greatest number of people. It's not a perfect system, but it is a negotiated system. Whereas communism is a utopianism, which basically says that um, to transcend our humanity, we must adopt the frailties of humanity, we must adopt communist principles. 
Um, so both sides are convinced they're the good guys. Um, that's an important fact to remember when you're studying the global aspect of the Cold War, is that both sides were convinced they were the good guys. Um, but in the democratic countries, freedom was occasionally suppressed if you were considered a communist. Um, and there was groups like the House of Un-American Activities that went around trying to, well, some people call it witch hunting, tried to hunt down and suppress communism at um, all costs. The accuracy of these kind of movements was iffy, but the thing to keep in mind is they were incredibly damaging for people in those countries. This has been a very brief, very quick introduction to the Cold War. Uh, further activities will expand on the different things that I have barely touched upon in this short lecture. Um, in any case, until later.